All right. Hello, everybody. Music Scene Investigation is on the air. Rich Wildman here. I just realized uh, something that I'll have to tell you about. It's really kind of funny when you think about it. And after I tell you, you, you know, you'll think, well, whatever, dude. But I think it's hilarious. I'm looking over at the radio station software that we run here. And normally it tells me how many people are actually listening to the show. And I see a big fat goose egg there, zero. And I remembered that uh, we had a server issue last week. Took them uh, three days to fix it. And we got up on a new server. Everything's running back up to normal on a new server. I didn't switch over the software to let me know how many people are listening anymore. So I'm still seeing zero, even though I know there are literally thousands of people listening to the broadcast today. You're optimistic. I know. I, I, I told you you'd be all like, wow, and then like, whatever. So <laughs> anyway. Anyway, Tommy's out in the chat room. He's got a new PC, his first PC, I think, and congratulations to him. I feel sorry for you, Tom. You need to see a doctor about that. You can get cream for it these days. Yeah, well, I would hope they could cure it somehow, but uh, yeah, I, I don't hold out much hope, to be perfectly honest. Anyway, uh, on Music Scene Investigation today, we're going to have three new songs that we put in front of the panel I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. Which would you like first? The bad news. Always the bad news and then you soften the blow with the good news afterwards. All right, all right. Well, the bad news is that uh, Mr. James Anderson will not be here today. He had uh, taken a trip over the weekend and did not make it back. Uh, it was our impression he was supposed to be here today. And uh, so he will not be here today. I will be sitting in his chair. All right, now you want the good news, Ian? That's, that's the real bad news, isn't it? It's not that James isn't here, it's that you're taking over his duties. Oh, so you think I, you think I twisted him around and gave you the <laughs> good news first and the bad news second, or what? <laughs> I'm, I'm confused. What's the good news, Rich? Well, the good news is we have you here on the hey. show today, so we're happy about that. So how are you, Ian? Everything going all right uh, where you're at? Yep. Uh, it's getting colder here now. It, winter is setting in. We've actually put the central heating on. Uh, I ban, ban my house from having the central heating on until at least November. If they're cold, they can put a sweater on. That's what my dad told me. It worked <laughs> for me. Well, you know I mean? uh, but I'm warming my cockles tonight with some Apple Jack, a nice uh, Jack Daniels apple punch. All right. Well, very good. That's uh, always a... Uh... Interesting thing. I mean, I, I don't think I've seen you drink anything but Jack ever. Oh, there's been times like water when I was really sick that time. With Jack on the side? Uh, just in case. <laughs> yeah, see? Just to get the bad taste out of your mouth afterwards, you know. Uh, I didn't think water was ever supposed to taste like anything, though. I meant of the sickness, but you know, either way. Oh, okay, my fault. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, uh, I thought yeah, I thought you were just insinuating that London had water that sucked. I don't know. Well, I mean, in relation to uh, Jack Daniels, is there's no comparison, is there? Really? Uh, yeah. Well, I, you know, I'm I'm sure the guys and gals down at the distillery in Kentucky who are watching the show. And uh, they, they probably are jumping up and down, appreciating you very much, right? I, now. I actually had this. I actually had this uh, this kind of discussion with a, a new colleague of mine through work. She's French, and uh, her parents own a vineyard. And she was you, they make wait, wait 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 they make whiskey out of uh, grapes. No 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 no. Bear with me. Okay. She was explaining to me the benefits. They make whiskey out of bears. <laughs> <laughs> that would be genius, wouldn't it? Filtered through bears. <laughs> um, <laughs> that would be like that coffee that's filtered through cats. <laughs> you get cats. Yeah, that's one of the most expensive um, coffees in Could the world. Could you imagine whiskey like, filtered through bears? How expensive that would be? They only produce like limited you tons really of that shit cat fancy. coffee. <laughs> uh, exactly. The reason, only, the reason they only produce limited amounts of that coffee is because they can't find enough staff to sort through the cat shit. <laughs> I'm lost now. I forgot where we got off on this anyway, conversation. Anyway, so, so, yeah, the, the vineyard, the vineyard. Okay. Right? They, they, make, they make wine. And she, this, this young lady, was, she's French, obviously, was explaining to me that two glasses of red wine a day is very good for your heart. <laughs> and, you know, scientists have come out and said that a glass of red wine a day, white wine a day, and uh, real ale, a pint of real ale a day, 
is also very good for your body. Don't, don't worry about the fact that you'll actually be a certified alcoholic if you've done that, but, you know. I uh, said, so what did you tell her? Did you tell her, like, okay, well, if a, a glass of, of wine a day is good for you, a pint of a Jack can't hurt either then? Well, Jack Daniels is, is made from grains, so grains are good for you. You have cereal for breakfast in the morning. Apparently, it helps clear you out. So, you know, it's got to be one of your five a day, surely. True. No, I, I agree. I think, uh, you know, when it comes right down to it, same for beer, barley, and hops. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. all grains. Tell me about the uh, witness statements from last week, and I've got the uh, card here. Uh, the artist we had on the broadcast, Element 113, Matthew Huff, and the Fundamentals, and uh, the Fundamentals, their song, Streets of Time, was our song of the week. What do the witness statements say? Well, people obviously heard my shout last week um, to, to get down and vote, because we've had one of the best weeks we've had in ages on votes, which is fantastic. Uh, but it was all a bit over the place. So we went for the fundamentals, Sleeps of Time, right. uh, which was song three. And uh, in the best songwriting, that received 57% of the votes um, compared to song two with 29% of the votes and song one with 14% of the votes. So they agreed with us on songwriting. From the point of view of performance, song two took 57 percent of the votes with song three taking 43 percent of the votes so they disagree with us on performance that makes sense and they, and they also disagree with us on mix and production as well with a song two again taking 57 percent of the votes uh song one 29 and song three 14 percent of the votes so it was a mixed bag and overall song two came out on top with the witness statement yeah, that's what it sounded like there, and uh, so in other words, uh, they thought the panel was wrong. Yeah, you could put it that way. But <laughs> no, no, I am putting that, it that way. We, we all know that's never the case. No, no, no. I, 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 I think I think they were <laughs> on something. I think they were onto something there. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong Look, too. But I don't think so. Just because you've given up smoking. No, no, no. I didn't give it up. It gave me up. <laughs> Let's meet our guest panelist on today's broadcast. Our guest panelist is, oh, well, he's one of the hardest working guys in show business. Just ask him. No, I'm kidding. He really is. I, I see this guy on Twitter all the time, and he's always in the studio, it seems, uh, from Apes, Pigs, and Spacemen fame. Mr. Paul Miro joins us. Hey, Paul, how are you, sir? I'm very well, Richard. How is yourself? I'm. I'm doing all right. It's really good to see you. I'm glad that uh, you're back on the broadcast with us. Back on broadcast and drinking freshly bottled water because I support capitalism in all of its forms. Take it from a tap, (laughs) put it in a bottle, charge an extortionist price and tell people we need to drink at least five bottles of this a day. I know. Amen, brother. It's amazing what we can get away with when we really put our hearts to it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to think of a way of perhaps doing something like that with music where there's actually nothing in there but people pay for it which is the inverse of how music works now of course where you put that's a great idea and get nothing it's, it's it's kind of you know water's the the actual opposite of the that music is an awesome idea and uh, if i remember correctly didn't someone like um uh, what's the guy's name david byrne or whatever at one point put an album together where he just made noise in a big empty room or something and called it music art of whatever he calls his crap he does and uh, go about selling CDs of it? You could be right. I think people have have kind of done that. Um, that, that it's more art and auteur sort of thing, isn't it, of doing something that's a bit um, left of sensible and going, yeah, but this is it. I'd put a shit in the bucket and um, and it's mine and it's special. Uh, not really a new concept, but if we could actually not make any music whatsoever, there was a guy who did it. I can't remember what his name was, but he did four, four minutes and 50-something seconds of silence, which was the longest you could get on a 45 rpm at pure sound quality so he, he did this pure sound quality of silence and <laughs> and sold that i remember that um reading something about that how so about, yeah, how about here here's a great work of art for you then uh why don't you take and do this uh an album one album 33 minutes aside or whatever you want to do and just have it one chord 
of every note on an 88 key grand played at once that lasts throughout the whole of the uh, the track and just no breaks no nothing just sounds like some of the um <laughs> latest classical renditions of stuff I've been mixing recently. <laughs> <at Jack. laughs> I honestly don't quite understand. There seems to be a speed contest going on with uh, musicians now, where it's it's translated into the the world of the top classical players as well. It used to be um, a guitarist speciality of what I call MIDI playing, where the notes are so fast that there's no room for emotion, and it seems to have, have transferred itself to the classical medium where these wonderful pieces of emotive music are just played like they're on really bad drugs um i don't i don't know what's happening but yeah that's probably the probably the next thing and then of course listen to it on an iphone and um, i think i i you know with classical music i think a lot of the problems with it is and uh, granted just my opinion uh, I think a lot of the problem with it is is a lot of these younger composers are thought of like you know uh, uh, the next best thing since Beethoven, you know, and they're told this at such a young age that they believe it and they think whatever they can flop down on a piece of paper is gold and they just go with it. I think that's uh, that trans that that transfers itself to every aspect of musical career. I have this conversation with. Um top music guys all all the time of if you take that analogy of people being hot housed if you like you know you see the the videos of the the korean and the the asian kids who uh, from justin two years bieber old, so, uh, well i'm talking about musicians um but if you, <laughs> if you look at the thing where Amen. there is an aspect of if you like hot housing without there having been the hard work and experience and the growth but you, you transfer that to, um, say, for example, things that are successful and huge. You might not, might not like them. You, you might dislike them. But you look at all the huge bands that are the biggest influences on everyone doing anything, however music has, has, has grown over the last 30 years. You look at things like, I don't know, let's go back to Genesis. They used to make make albums that lost money because the record industry had money to develop talent to make it work over three albums, and they were allowed to do what the hell they liked to learn their craft, to develop this thing, to take a few knocks, and then at the end of that, they would have soul everything: Pink Floyd, Stones, all of them. None of them made any money on their first albums, but now the pressure is on to create the myth, to to do the smoke and mirrors thing. And, you know, albums aren't made anymore. People, people release singles. Singles, ironically, are selling more than they ever have. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily lead on to there being an album. But that person who is releasing the album has to be the new Bob Dylan, has to be the new Jimi Hendrix, has to be this author, this absolute genius or whatever. And they've not really left their bedroom or, you know, um, like a Ed Sheeran thing where Rich Mummy paid for him to be in a in a flat in London and, and get management and make it look like he was some poor kid who'd struggled but actually bought the right agency to promote what he was doing. It's all... It's all all a, a case of making sure all the boxes are ticked and it's all a big fat lie really isn't it that's empty and soulless and vacuous i've stopped smoking too <laughs> <laughs> there you go a little uh, interesting fact that 433 that you were talking about the, the piece of music was yeah that was, i wasn't far off with the time then was i yeah it was by john cage and it was uh, it. conceived around 1947 48 <laughs> he even went to the lengths of writing this out for, for, for <laughs> different for different instruments, uh, and said it was a basically it was a piece that could be played by any ensemble of instruments, and it just basically started with a rest. I love and it, and that was it. And, <laughs> and he, even, he even went so far, he even went so far as to getting the piano player on some of his pieces uh, to close the instrument and just play the wood on the the, the cover of the, the uh, piano. That's genius, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, there you go. Stuff like that. Now, let me fix my mic. You hear that? It sucks. Things break when oh. you stop smoking, Rich. I'm telling you. Are you with us? I'm, I'm actually going to have to blame somebody <clears throat> on this one, I think. Blame me. Uh, I'm here, but... It's the, it's the mirror curse. My mic isn't yep. working. It sucks. 
I'll tell I you what, while, while, he's, while he's sorting out his microphone, Paul, what have you been up yes. to, mate? What have you been doing? Uh, what, what's going on with you? What's been going on? Well, I've been writing a, a heck of a lot of stuff for TV, just stacks and stacks, probably more this year than I've done in any previous year. Um, working hard on a new two album release, which I'm hoping to get pledge funded next year called Sonombre, which I'm really looking forward to sounding fantastic and just generally living in the studio and making music. Awesome. Come on then, tell us a little bit more about this album. What's, what's the deal with that? When we're looking at, we've got a potential release. Um, when are we looking for, ah, you know what? That's a, that's a bit of a, how long is a piece of string? I was hoping to have it <laughs> out in 2015. Um, I'm now, Kind of speculating that uh, I think it might be April 2016. It's all down to uh, obviously making a living, which selling albums no longer does for any human being apart from perhaps a, a very small handful. Uh, so I have to do other things to um, raise money. And therefore, the albums kind of keep me taking a back burner and uh it's going to be quite a dark project certainly more proud of this than i've ever been of anything i've done solo so far i've got to say that started out as a single album idea quite dark sort of uh i don't know kind of nick cage meets tom Waits meets aerosmith i i guess that's as close as i can say in in three comparisons of stuff that i don't really uh, i don't know be like that and um <laughs> the it's uh going to be two albums uh which will be one pledge campaign after the other because essentially i always write at least 10 or 15 tracks in addition to what will end up on the album but this time i'm so proud of every single one of them that i decided to make two albums rather than leave the rest as filler well that makes sense I mean, and, uh, it, it explains why you're you're so hard to get a hold of on our show, because you're always busy. It's very true. This is the first Sunday evening that I've not been flat out for a fair few months. Yeah, it's I cannot believe that we're approaching December again already. It, yeah. it has really been an incredible ride this year. Uh, I I've churned out. Uh, to full studio production, written, produced, played, performed, executed, mixed, mastered, this year, 260 tracks. And I think if it carries on the way it's going, I'm actually going to hit 300 tracks this year, which wow. I've never been anywhere near that before. Uh, it really is quite a colossal amount. It's pretty amazing. I mean, uh, like I said, you, you are... So I, I just hope it keeps going, to be honest. Yeah, you're keeping busy. There is no doubt about that. Ian, did you have something to, you wanted to say before we actually uh, let my mic uh, go out again? <laughs> no, I was just going to say, you know, I mean, I, I know a few people in the industry who have given me a little bit of inside information on Paul's album, and, and I was just going to say, this all started, as I understand it, from one of your TV projects, the sort of dark sort of country style of stuff, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah, it was. Um, I had a project for, um, yeah, for the dark Western kind of vibe that uh, is, you know, that true detective sort of, of, of thing, baritone guitars and uh, dark, moody sounds, somber vocals. And the, the, the main thing of that was the, uh, the old Western themes of singing about the devil. And I really liked the vibe but I didn't really get that context lyrically. And what I thought was I'd really like to turn the devils into, um, rather than kind of fictitious things, the devils who are controlling us right now, our kind of the, the demons who are more tactile than imaginary, shall we say. So it's quite so a it's beautiful an album. It's an album about giving up smoking then? No, that's Rich's <laughs> album that's coming yeah. out. Yeah, that's mine. It's coming out very soon. We're going to have a video on that as well. It's just me banging my head against a wall. Yeah, yeah. It's called Trashing the Uke. That's now, that, that I'd like to see. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Trashing a Uke or Banging My Head Against a Wall? 
both. But, well, the, the video of you trashing your you while banging your head against the wall. Uh, good problem. Um, why don't you? Why don't you hold the uke against the wall, and then bang your head against the uke? Ah, uh, yeah, there you go. Well, we'll see what we can do for you, Ian. I mean, anything to make you happy, obviously, is uh, is what it's all about. At least I'm picturing one of those. You know the things that they have kids those with all the balls. You know that they yeah, yeah. show the kids in it, it's full of balls. Maybe do one of those. It's full of rubber cigarettes. How about that? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> for the video, just give me a lighter and I'd be happy. Yeah, <laughs> light them up. All right, uh, like I said, we do have three songs that we want to take and uh, go over today. We want to make sure we get everybody an opportunity to listen to. So, uh, let's question, question the chat room before we do. All right. Names, Paul. Give us names. I think Box of Crap's asking, you know, what TV shows now have you been writing on? Can, can you tell us? Uh, oh dear. I had quite a few BBC shows in the UK. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Uh, wasn't Portlandia, one, huh? Portlandia Not in bad. the States, um, uh, Arrow, uh, Marvel, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, I watch that show every week. You you mean I need to actually listen to what the hell's going on now? Oh, God, I don't know. The thing is, is, is a lot of the time I'm writing for uh, companies and I'm not writing specifically for any show i mean i've got stuff that is specific i'm on the the current worldwide Persia ad um their campaign that's my voice on there didn't actually write that one but that's just me singing on it uh, a friend of mine chris hollis did that and um generally what you do is you get commissioned to write a piece in a certain vein that sounds like this you will be you know you'll be given a brief that is uh, genre pacific what they want in it what musicality they want what kind of melodic contact what kind of pacing tempos all those sort of things you write a piece and it gets used everywhere you know um it, it ends up being in a library catalog and then programs start to use it tv shows start to use it and i've got everything from uh bbc kind of uh dramas to <laughs> holiday shows to i i don't know the list is ridiculous the last prs statement i had was 1400 shows were using my stuff in the last three months so i can't tell you what they all are i just know that um portlandia was one of the best paid ones so that's why i remembered it all right well if we if a political <laughs> if a political person had been using it you wouldn't know because they wouldn't pay you probably um, I mean, if if it was a political person, that's a different thing because they do have to actually get your permission. And uh, the reason know. I ask is because here in the states, uh, you know, uh, there have been uh, uh, the politicians kind of use music theme music for their uh, for their campaign. And yeah. uh, in the past years, you know, Fleetwood Mac have been used for the the Clintons, for example, one year. But uh, you know, we've had uh, some some candidates this year have used uh, certain musicians and the musicians have come out and like uh, quit using my music, you know, stuff like uh -huh. that. And it's because the politicians generally don't ask, they just do it. Yeah. I also think, I mean, I, I've, I've seen some of the things like the Donald Wig thing of, of trying to use, was it Neil Young or was it Bruce Springsteen either way? Just uh, again, just showing their absolute lack of, um, of, of understanding of the the writer's intent when those songs were written you know um yeah <laughs> i found that quite amusing really for old wig head to be trying to use a neil young song but hey neil young's another animal so. uh, yeah neil i don't get along with neil young anyway that's all that's a different different story we can go into at some other time when you and i are talking over drinks or something indeed <laughs> without smoking without smoking at least that's what we're going to tell everybody yeah, yeah. <laughs> hang about, hang about, go back. Complete silence, right? Okay. A addict. Yeah, yeah. His mama didn't raise no quitter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Ian. We really appreciate that. It's all right. Yeah, whatever, dude. All right. Uh, <laughs> three songs to take a listen to on today's broadcast. We're going to get to it. We're going to do that right now. It is song number one on the show today, everybody. Sit back, enjoy, and we'll be back in just a moment. This is track number one on today's 
Music Scene Investigation. Song number one on today's music scene investigation. Let's go over to Ian and get his thoughts on this one. Ian, track number one, sir. Yippee, I, I. That's what I can say. Uh, okay. It's sort of song um, that, yeah, it's got that good up tempo feel about it. Something maybe the Levelers or New Model Army would do. Um, but the mix on this is all over the place. It sounds to me like it's all in mono. Possibly live, because there's a few bits in there which you think, yeah, that could have been done better, that could have been overdubbed, maybe it hasn't been. Um, and, yeah, everything's just coming sort of straight down the middle, and it's all very loud. And there's no space in this mix whatsoever, which is a shame, because I think you've actually got quite a good track, sort of upbeat, sort of uh, folky rock track going on here. And um, I would have liked to have heard more of what was going on. You've got that uh, flute in there, which sounded good. Um, you've got some good backing vocals. The guy's got, uh, from what I can hear, he's got quite a, a good sort of voice delivery-wise on this. Um, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff going on. It's just a shame. It really does sound like everything's just coming from the middle. It's been recorded on maybe one mic um, in a room with a lot of reverb, and everything's just melding into each other. And, uh, you know, get into a studio, record this properly, get some stereo going on, get some space for those instruments. Let's hear that vocal properly that's getting lost in a lot of places you know there's a lot of good stuff going on here a lot of good performances but you just can't make them out from each other and that's really my own biggest criticism of this is is that mix 
everything else sounds like a really good tight band who are used to playing live and who are used to going out and doing this. They just need to get into a proper studio and do it. All right. I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Ian. Now, I'm going to sit in for James, and uh, that means I'm going to give you my opinion of this. My opinion is very short, very sweet, very to the point. Intro. Why? I didn't care for the intro. I didn't see the point of it. Unless you just want to introduce me to the fact that you got a flute in the song. I mean, like I wouldn't figure it out when it came in later. Maybe that's why you did the intro. I'm not really sure. Again, uh, Ian, Ian mentioned this already. It sounded like a live recording. I, I'm sure it was. Uh, whoever recorded it probably only had one mic to record it with, which is why it sounded the way it did. It was recorded very loudly, which uh, tends to happen when you're recording live because you want to make sure as a sound guy you're trying to capture everything because if you didn't record it loud, you wouldn't. And uh, that's why it, the actual recording is the way it is. And I, I hesitate to say bad, but yeah, it kind of was. Uh, I agree with Ian. Get into a studio, do it right, and it, it'll be a lot better. There is a song here. It's probably a fairly good song. If it were recorded properly, I think it would be a very good song. All right, that's all I got to say about it. Let's go over to Mr. Paul Miro. Paul, what do you think about uh, track number one? Uh, yeah, I the, the the intro. Yeah, you're right. I actually thought it was going to be something completely different, but I think that was probably a deliberate thing of, hey, we're going to take you from by surprise by coming in with something really mad over, and then it really gives the impact to when we kick you in the face with a drunken Irish protest song. And um, that <laughs> is, is my thing with it, of the whole thing about uh, what Ian said, Leveler's New Model Army thing. Yeah, I take that on board. It's got that kind of folky thing. The guys can obviously play. It sounds like they were drunk, but not quite drunk enough and obviously having a great time. And um, I don't actually care about it being produced like a bag of shite. It doesn't matter because all that's about is... If you did go and record that properly, no one would be interested um, in in it as it is, however it's produced or whatever, because it's not a commercial field of music, which is no offence to you whatsoever. I think that as a, as a band, you're having real fun. It sounds great. It's a very specific, a very esoteric market. And I think that the way it is will probably help you get gigs. And that's the way that people will get interested in what you do, which will raise you the money, hopefully, to go and record it properly, to sell it to the people who like what you do by playing at, at um, live events and that is it in a nutshell really I think you're going to, it's going to be one of you're going to be one of those great afternoon festival bands um, you know all the, all the great uh, piss up on, on Paddy's Night kind of band I think it's obviously going to be something that works really well live and you should get a collection of those tracks together and go and try and get an agent if you don't already have one to go and get as much live work as you can and then record in in a better format after that because to record them better now would serve no purpose because it isn't it isn't a marketable thing you know it's not going to sell as it is which again is no disrespect to you that's just the nature of the market all right i appreciate it thank you very much gentlemen and uh we've got two more tracks to take a listen to we're going to get to it after i introduce track number one so here it is. This is uh, what track number one was. It was called First to Die. It was from Professor Messer, and we appreciate him sending his track in to Music Scene Investigation. Professor Messer. It's a uh, rhyme, guys. Never well done, Rich. Thank you. <laughs> I, didn't, I, I, I didn't. I can't take credit for it, though. I didn't do it. It was the professor who did. So there you go. Uh, well, that uh, yeah. was a bit of a mess, wasn't it? Uh, hey, hey, he is the professor. What can you say about it? All right, uh, two more tracks to take a look. I'm going to get letters, I know. Do you think, you think it's Italian? No, I yeah, hope, I hope Bitchy not. Richie, is that you? <laughs> no, I, is that your <laughs> rhyme? <laughs> no, no, not my rhyme. All right, let's uh, listen to track number two on the broadcast right now. Here it is, everyone. Track number two on today's music scene investigation. Enjoy it. Here it is.
That is track number two on the broadcast today. Let's bring the panel back in and find out what they think of what they heard. I'm going to start with Paul this time around, just because I can. Paul, what do you think about track number two? I like the song. I don't know what the hell it was about. Uh, I kept trying to work out what he was spelling out, and uh, it didn't grab me enough for it because there were too many letters. If you're going to do a spelling out thing, I just suggest making it a shorter word. Um, that, <laughs> that's totally irrelevant. Said, said, uh, said the, the man, my, the my, man my, who has voted... Come on, I've got to say this. Said the man who has voted what? the most intelligent man in rock two years in the in the row by Kerrang! magazine. Yeah. Um, yeah that's right. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> I, I'm trying to I'm trying to be A and R guy here though, and be you know, mm. and, and the cutting edge commerciality thing, which of course has, again has absolutely no consequence anymore because there is no music industry. That aside, though, being serious, I really like the song. It had an Elvis Costello squeezy kind of thing, which I really like. Um, from the point of production, it was very flat. Uh, drums were over loud. Well, the whole track was brick wall mastered and a bit dynamic uh, lacking in range because of that but the mix hard left right guitars that sounded very di'd and and amp sims against live drums that sounded like cardboard boxes vocals way back in the mix all things very uh, lifeless from the point of effects and things and it did overall sound very dated on a production style it sounded kind of like an early 80s sort of sound palette as opposed to where we we are now that impacts somewhat on my enjoyment of the track, but I just thought it was a great song that I'd like to hear recorded properly. Like the vocal sound, uh, the, the vocalist stylings and delivery. Um, it felt uh, kind of slightly humorous and dark, which is something that I like. And melodically, I liked it. The arrangement was good perhaps dynamically it could have lifted and fallen a little bit more with a bit more range but overall top song all right i appreciate that thank you and uh, before we go to ian let me just say my thoughts about the song i agree with everything paul said i couldn't understand what the song was about because the vocals needed to be higher in the mix the music needed to be turned mm -hmm. down uh the uh, as we talked before the show the loudness wars continue and these first two songs are key points into that, um, regardless of whether they were recorded live or in studio, uh, as uh, we see here, uh, it's just too damn loud, and it, it buries the vocals, because uh, somebody said in the chat room, I, I think that, uh, hello, there we go, somebody said in the chat room that uh, they think one of the guys playing the guitars mixed it. I think so. Yeah. I do. <laughs> and uh, I think... Know, I I think what that is, it's, it's, it's a fundamental uh, error with, with basic production yep. is those guitars are compressed to hell. They're panned really hard left and right. So when it is mastered as a brick wall, it's going to suck it out even more. Unless the vocals themselves in the original mix have some kind of limiter on them as opposed to just a compressor, they're going to get buried when you do the mastering. Yep. Anything that's hard left and right and compressed is just going to sound, yeah, like the guitarist mixed it. So Yeah, yeah it, I mean, yeah. I would love to to hear this mix differently because I think there's a good song here. I really enjoyed uh, what I heard. I just couldn't understand it because the vocals uh, were too far back. And because of the tempo of the song, trying to follow, like, like you said, Paul, trying to follow what they were spelling was virtually impossible. Mm -hmm. um, but what was there was good. It was enjoyable. It was a lot of fun to listen to. But damn, it was loud. And damn, I couldn't, I couldn't understand the vocals. It was sad that way. Yeah. Ian, what do you think about uh, what you heard there on track number two? You see, this to me was a fundamental uh, flaw in production, was they didn't let the singer in the control room when it was being mixed. They, they basically rolled a spliff and said, look, you go and smoke that, we'll be okay in here. And then they locked the door behind him. That's what happened. We all know that's how it works. You don't like singers in control rooms. Uh, you, know? you, just, you just bring this up about smoking because Paul and I don't smoke anymore? <laughs> I, I, I just maybe get a dig in there. Anyway... Um, <laughs> You know, to me, this has got like a, a mid-90s, that sort of post-grunge pop sound, bands like Lit and Third Eye Blind and stuff like that, which I love. 
And I think, you know, the way the guitars were being played and the arrangement of the track and some of the hooks really caught some of that feel for me. Uh, Pinky in the, the chat room says Bare Naked Ladies, same, same sort of era. And, um... Wild Arts. Yeah, I mean... Mm, no. As much as... No. Not quite a bit too poppy for the Wild Arts, you know what I mean? Yeah, maybe. I just hear it as being, you know, it should be more that way. It should have JCM 800s rather than DI guitars and the drums should be That's bigger and fatter. That's kind of where, yeah... yeah. That's kind of where I was going to go with it. I think, you know, that it needs to be a bit harder and it needs to be a bit tougher. And, you know, it sounds to me like a local band who are very well rehearsed, probably playing lots of gigs, probably got quite a good local following, have gone into their local studio and sort of done uh, a recording, probably mostly live, with an engineer, not a producer. And they've uh. produced it themselves and they've knocked it down how they play um live and de then left the track at that and it's been mixed by the guy who runs the studio and they've kind of walked out with the cd you know uh, this to me needs a producer on board well ian uh just uh -huh. interrupt you here for a second first of all box crap says he does he doesn't think the producer was allowed in the studio for mixing of it either and uh pinky says uh just for uh for our uh information i guess paul they were trying to spell rubber dumpster Ah, okay. Yeah, okay. makes makes total sense well, thanks now, for right? Letting us know that. Yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> if the vocals were loud enough, we'd have heard that. Exactly. Exactly. I don't know. You can right. be my you can be my rubber dumpster. There you go. That must have been it. All right, uh, track number two. It's called not rubber dumpster. It's called Drink Punch Jail. It's by a group called Wild. Finish, the Wild Finish, and we appreciate their sending their track in Wild Music Arts. Scene Investigation. What was that, Ian? Wild Hearts. There's Paul reference. Wild yeah. Hearts. Okay. There you go, see? There was a, yeah. uh, a television, or not, not a television show, but a movie here in the States a number of years ago called Wild Hogs. And, okay. Uh, Wild Rubber Dumpster. And I don't yeah. think they had Rubber Dumpster in it, but I don't know. Anyway, we have uh, our final song, the last song of the day coming up right now. So here it is, everyone. Certainly hope you enjoy it. Track number three on today's MSI. Sit back. Enjoy. Here it is.
that is track number three on the broadcast today. Let's bring the panel in, start things out with Mr. Paul Miro. Paul, what do you think about track number three? Uh, mm. It was kind of like what would happen if Eddie Vedder and Joe Walsh had a love child, really. Um, but it was a real <laughs> u- ugly, malformed child with no ideas. Um, it it kind of went nowhere, but I liked it. I don't. The guitar playing was great. I really, I, I really did hear a lot of Joe Walsh riffage going on in there, and vocalists. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, he'd even got uh, um, Eddie Vedder's vibrato, same vibrato in the same ranges. So, I mean, it's great, great voice. It was kind of one of those tracks that I could imagine being on a Sons of Anarchy type show. Um, I don't know if there are any more Sons of Anarchy type shows, but one of those chasing things where it makes sense there, but nowhere else. Uh, it'd be great on an album, but I, I don't know where it lies. There's nothing about it that I don't like. But this being a thing whereby I think the whole idea is to try and, and make a career in music or whatever, which is an increasingly hard thing to do. It just sounds like something that is uniquely old school Americana um, that I don't know or wouldn't know what to do with other than to say, like, yeah, it's great. It's really well played. There's no problems with it whatsoever. The vocals are great. The guitar playing is great. Um, I, I won't go into production because I don't think it's of, of any consequence whatsoever in this instance. I just think it's kind of one of those. I tell you, let me just diversify a little bit. Here's a here's a, a real, a true story for you. Um, average white band, right? One of the hugest bands ever to grace the, the planet from different style of music entirely, but from a, an era where that that sound came from, from that 70s sort of a thing. And you think average white band, um, they uh, still have pick up the pieces as one of the most played tracks ever in history. And it still gets played over 14 million times a year on Spotify and all of the other streaming networks. And they have spent with Joe Mardin, who's Arif Mardin's son, who's an absolute legend in one of the best studios in the world, used their own money just to make a new album. And the album's recorded and it's mixed and it's mastered and it's cost an absolute fortune. And by all accounts, it sounds absolutely incredible. And no one in the world will release that album. No record label will touch it because it doesn't have a place. And this is what the problem I have with this track is. It's all there, all the things about it I like. And you go, yeah, that's really good fun. But I don't see there's a place for it anywhere. Does that make sense? I don't know. That's 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 why I'm confused. I'm if as long as it makes sense to you, that's all that matters, right? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> sorry, sorry to be vague on that. I re- I really I really liked it. I just don't think I don't see what I could advise on what you do with it. All right. Well, no, that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. Let me tell you what I think about it, and we'll let Ian come in and, and voice his piece last because uh, because I care what Ian thinks not to say that I don't care what Paul thinks because I do so don't get me wrong you're thinking yourself a whole mate you carry on I know it I know it I'm, I'm bad about this it's because I quit smoking I'm telling you it's exactly what it is I like to you know I Paul you said you can't complain about this I can complain about this a little bit and I'm going to just a touch and will yeah, and just uh, just a smidge. I want to complain about it. My complaint is I think the vocals should have been louder. I'd like to hurt them up in the mix a little bit. I think the the bass player, I said this in chat room, I think the bass player mixed this track. We had the guitarist mix the last track. Some guy they picked up off the street mixed the first track. I think the bass player mixed this track. A lot of low end. I saw someone in their chat room, uh, I think Pinky said it in the chat room, that the uh, bass player and drummer were very tight. I agree with that. It sounded really good in that regard. I think they uh, lifted a riff from uh, Ted Nugent in the rhythm track of this yeah, yeah. particular track. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but overall, I mean, the, the song itself as a, a whole 
was well done. I mean, I can't fault what I heard on it. I can fault how I heard it put together, but it wasn't a fault of the musicians, the musicianship of the track or the singer's uh, vocal ability. I mean, I think everybody knew what they were doing and did it very well. I just think in the end it was put together a little wrong, and I think that could uh, could be done better and could have uh, helped make the song sound better. And maybe uh, if it were done differently, uh, would have given the song a place, as, as Paul mentioned, he didn't think it had. So I think it would have helped that. Ian, over to you, my friend, on song number three. Okay, yeah, mix-wise, vocals buried, uh, very loud guitars and bass and bits and pieces. Just bring those vocals up, bring those out, I want to hear them. Um, you know, band was amazingly tight, uh, especially rhythm section. Uh, some great riffs thrown in there, good vocals, as, as Paul said, sort of that grungy edge to them, definitely. I mean, which, which made me sort of think of bands like Blackstone Cherry and the Zac Brown Band. Um, now, you're not saying it's quite the same as, as those, but, you know, similar sort of feel in that sort of almost country Americana heavy rock. I mean, uh, Blackstone Cherry, massive market for them. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, as Paul says, it's, it's a difficult world out there, and, you know, Blackstone Cherry have sort of made a living doing this sort of heavy sort of country rock inspired stuff. But is it time for a new band in that sort of style to break out and do that sort of thing. I don't know. You know, and I use Blackstone Cherry as a comparison, as a, as a compliment to these guys. I've seen Blackstone Cherry live. They're absolutely amazing, and I, I love their albums. So, yeah, it's a difficult one. It, you've got definitely got a very good band there. And, 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 you know, I think all three bands this week, I would love to go and see live at some point in time because they all seem pretty spot on to what they're doing. Yeah, I think all, I all think, three you know, bands were great at what they did. It was just the mixes this week. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, you know, yeah, great song. Uh, great song, great arrangement, great players. Again, mix issues. Um, that's that's me, me, really. All right. All right, well, let's find out track number three, the name and artist of that one. Track number three is called Buzzin', and it's from a group called Young Fellas. So uh, thank you for sending that in, Young Fellas. That's Buzzin'. On today's music scene investigation. All right, gentlemen, it's time to select a song of the week, as we're wont to do. So, uh, what do you guys think? What are your thoughts on this? Well, I, th I think, as we said, you know, we've got three tracks here this week that, you know, if you saw the band live, they'd probably be thoroughly enjoy enjoyable to watch and you'd probably have a good night. But, you know, coming across as a recorded piece, that's where, where they're suffering. Um, so, I don't know, from my point of view, I think I'm going to go with track number three. I think it was the most high energy, I think it was probably some of the best performances we've had tonight, and you've got a really, really strong band and, and track there, it's just a shame about the vocals being low, and, and etc. All right, uh, Paul, your thoughts, or do you want me to go first? No, no, I'm, uh, the, uh, the, Ian's virtually said what I was going to say from the point of uh, it, it being a, a, a live sort of um, interest this, this week. And my decision is also track number three, not quite from the same premise of, of Ian's, but it's from the point of seeing the context of it being a live thing, because I don't see there being any avenue of release for this stuff, unless it's based on a live, uh, a live following that this band has managed to establish by hook or by crook or however managed they do it. I see band one playing Paddy's nights, parties, private functions and smaller things. I see band two playing indoor shows to uh, more indie crowds. And I see band three play in your Americana type fest with the monster trucks and all that sort of thing. And perhaps getting uh, support to bigger bands. So therefore I think band three will possibly be a more commercial proposition by the fact of them playing bigger gigs. And also I thought overall it was the best musicianship of the night. So band three for me. All right. I appreciate that. Uh, that song will be our song of the week. Just let me let you know my vote uh, because I'm outvoted regardless of what I do. Um, my vote is a little bit different. I, I, I'm basing my vote on uh, the one I wrote the least about on the back of my card here. 
And you can see right there, it's song number two. Uh, so my vote is going to be Rich, for... <laughs> we're not broadcasting video, dude. I know. But we actually are recording video. So if you watch the video, you can actually see what I wrote about each of the bands. And uh, so I invite you to do that. We'll post the video, of course, on YouTube, as we always do on our site as well. But uh, the fact of the matter is... Uh, number two is the one uh, th that I vote for, uh, The Wild Finish and uh, Drink Punch in Jail. I like the title, number one. The, even though there were problems with every song, I think we, we all agree that the, the, the problems were in the mix and mastering of the music, not in the musician's ability to play the music or not, in the, not a fault of the song itself. Uh, we all agree that they were very good. It was just the uh, the actual mix and mastering that caused the issues. And uh, that's the reason I went with number two is because overall I thought it was a uh, much more enjoyable, at least to me, uh, from that perspective. Well, you're outvoted, so it doesn't matter. Me and Paul win. No, that's no, no, that's no, no. exactly right. I don't think, I mean, I, it's a difficult... <laughs> I, I, I'd love to pick on Rich, but I, I agree. I actually... Pref I, the favorite song of the night was song number two but i couldn't hear the song yeah. so I that's mean, why it's three for me yeah so, um, any any band that spells out rubber dumpsters kind of gets my yeah vote. no it was almost just a, a given i almost wasn't going to listen to track number three because that was so good but <laughs> had the vocal been louder and i'd have been with my pad writing that down you know that would have been that, that would have been great but you know <laughs> Louder vocals, you'd have been taking away the mythical MSI prize. There you go. All right, young <laughs> fellas buzzing our song of the week. Hey, Man. James is in the chat room. Oh, there you go, Mr. James Anderson in the chat room. Good to see you, James. Paul, I want to thank you for being here. Great to have you join us again. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure. And great to see you guys. It really is great to have you with us. Ian, uh, you want to tell them where we're going, what we're doing, what's going to happen. Uh, of course, we're going to be back next week with another uh, set of tracks to take a listen to. But after that, we've got some changes. Ian? Okay, cue violin music. All right. I don't have a violin. So, oh, yeah. Damn. So, um, so, yeah, MSI is uh, coming to an end, as you know it, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's taken a lot of work and a lot of effort over the past five years and uh, we've decided that we need to move on. We need to change the format, we need to do something a bit fresh and a bit different because, uh, yeah, we're not quite getting back what we're putting in, basically. So we're, uh, we're, we're changing things and we're looking at doing 15-minute podcasts, uh, looking at music videos on YouTube. So we're going to stay with the music theme um but we're going to talk about one video each week we'll still have guests on uh we'll still have a panel we'll still do something similar to msi but we're going to talk about one video a week and uh we'll give links to the videos you can go and watch it and we'll do blogs about it and it's going to be different but it's going to be fun and it's going to be fresh and uh hopefully a bit more interesting for people as well all right i appreciate that ian thank you again paul thank you very much it's always great to have you join us and uh Certainly hope we uh, can get you back on with us uh, in the new format as well. Absolutely. That way yeah. we can make fun of not only the way people sound, but the way they look. No, I'm kidding. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, mean that way. Don't, don't, just, don't, just don't review any of Paul's videos. No, I'm, I'm just turning mean because I quit smoking. That's all I can say. Yeah, you just lost all humor and, and good nature that you never had, haven't you? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a bully. I know this. It's, it's the way it is. All right. Uh, yeah. Then I'll be ostracized by society because nobody likes bullies anymore. No okay. one likes ostriches either. I know. They're just it's the long necks. Ostracized. You it's will the, be ostracized. It's, it's the gir giraffe necks on them. That's what it is. Well, you can see his feathers. <laughs> Do you realise, there's a, there's a bit of science for you, do you realise the giraffe's neck isn't actually that long? It's its legs that are freakily long. <laughs> you know that? I did not know this. You just a I bit of research, because this freaked me out. The, the <laughs> giraffe's neck in relation to the rest of its body is, is not inordinately long, but its legs are the longest of any mammal, and they're ridiculous. But you don't notice them because they're so thin, you know? It's a bit like... A bit, I think what, know, we ought to, think what we ought to do is, uh, is 
What, what? Ninja <laughs> Ninja legs on a giraffe. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just kind of lost my train of thought. Ninja giraffe. That's where it came from. Kind it's of. an abbreviation. Ninja giraffe. I thought a ninja giraffe was the boats they used. Uh, no, I think it's like a, <laughs> something that you sail in on a ninja uh, raft. I thanks don't. for being here, everybody. <laughs> Really appreciate everybody joining us out in the chat room today. I hope you come back again next weekend. We'll have, uh, as I said, three more songs to put in front of the panel. While they discuss giraffes and ostriches and ninjas and rafts and stuff like that, we're going to play out with Young Fellas and their track Buzzin' right here on MSI. Thanks for being here, everybody. We'll talk to you again next week. Have a good one. Bye.